Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, we invite Justin Trudeau to go face to face with Canadian voters and Rosie. Slower. Uh, your and budget more was passed, challenged. your throne speech went ahead. Yeah, but the conversion therapy wasn't banned. You put we that on the table support, at the last minute. Yeah, we did not. We've been working on it for many, many months. Took a while. You know that. Took a while. Yeah. More of our exclusive interviews with federal party leaders. Also tonight, the pandemic's assault on the front line. It just broke my heart, and it was the inhumane conditions that we left patients in. Personal stories from nurses bearing the brunt. Meanwhile, across Canada, protesters target hospitals. This kind of harassment and intimidation is really repugnant. And the children are back in school, so is COVID-19. I can't overthink it, it just gets too frustrating. What's happening to keep them safe? This is The National. One week from tonight, the polls will close and Canadians will have chosen their next government. Now, many of you may still be unsure where you stand. So to help you decide over the next few days, we are bringing party leaders face to face with voters just like you. We began last night with Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. Tonight, the man he hopes to replace. Justin Trudeau was likely hoping to lead a new majority government. But 30 days into the campaign, it is anyone's guess how things will turn out. It should always be hard to convince Canadians that you're the right person to lead them because this is a really important job in an amazing country with huge challenges. Tonight, we are dedicating most of our program to four undecided voters who will question him about his policies and promises. Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton will guide the discussion and then she'll ask some questions as well. That is in about 20 minutes. Well, let's start with Canadian hospitals, the pandemic's fourth wave bearing down. COVID patients surged by hundreds in just the past week, the vast majority of them not fully vaccinated. But as doctors and nurses work day and night to save those lives, today, just outside, protesters in several cities gathered to call vaccine mandates tyrannical. Thomas Daigle tracks the protests and the response. This is medical tyranny! With neither popular opinion nor science on their side, anti-vaxxers came to be heard at a contentious location for a protest. This kind of harassment and intimidation at this particular place is really repugnant. They rallied outside hospitals like the Toronto General. Some patients needing a police escort just to get by. They have the center here. Chris Masucci is being treated for a brain tumor. So it's a pretty major thing that I'm going through and uh, this definitely doesn't help. Sharing conspiracy theories and dubious claims. This is not a, a virus that affects the unvaccinated. Many here question the threat from COVID, though it's killed millions, and they doubt the safety of the vaccine, though it's been given to billions. This is keeping other people safe, is but it, it not? No, it depends on if you look outside the traditional Teresa Tam and her... Uh, if you look outside science, I guess. Well, outside their health experts. Organizers called for protests in all 10 provinces. A small crowd responded in Winnipeg, though in places like Montreal and Halifax, only a few dozen turned up. A reminder, these demonstrators don't speak for most in this country. It is definitely the minority position in Canada. It's about 10% of the population that is historically uh, anti-vaccination. Protesters targeted Edmonton's Royal Alexandra Hospital, with Alberta's premier calling their actions appalling and outrageous. In Ontario, a nurse started this petition, calling on the government to create protest-free safe zones around hospitals. More than 10,000 have signed. It's just appalling and very disheartening to think of my coworkers and colleagues um, and also patients and their families having to, you know, endure that. Okay, so Thomas, on the campaign trail, it seems there's broad agreement. These protesters shouldn't be targeting hospitals. Yeah, the Liberal, Conservative and NDP leaders on the campaign trail today, Andrew, all made a point to tell the protesters to stop targeting healthcare workers, calling it intimidation or harassment. Now, I should mention, uh, some of the protesters I spoke to here today outside Toronto General Hospital, uh, they voiced support for the People's Party of Canada. Now, while they were out here demonstrating, uh, the party's leader, Maxim Bernier, was tweeting, comparing vaccine passports in Canada to mass surveillance in China. Andrew. Okay, Thomas Daigle, thank you. You're welcome. 
Now, inside hospitals, the tyranny comes from the virus itself. Nurses are bracing for another fall and winter of incredible strain and impossible choices. Vicodopia shows us the toll it has already taken and what that means for patients. There's been no rest for Aram Chagala, an emergency department nurse in Toronto, not even for the death of her father from COVID-19. Only the same recurring questions. When is this going to end? When is this going to stop? When are we going to return to our normal pre-COVID days? Many of her colleagues have had it. They've either transferred or quit. So I don't think that this is a surprise anymore. There's going to be a lot of burnout, exhaustion and heavy turnover. After a decade on the front lines, this nurse quit. We're protecting her identity. Speaking out may affect her employment. It just broke my heart and it was the inhumane conditions that we left patients in. At the height of the third wave, she says her hospital struggled to fill staff shortages and the quality of care suffered. There weren't enough people to do the CPR and give the medications needed to revive people and it it was very scary it was very what are scary the consequences of that death even before the pandemic a national survey found 60 percent of nurses plan to leave their jobs within a year due to poor working conditions and exhaustion during the pandemic how many left is still unknown but the front lines are suffering even when we have patients who are uh, who are unvaccinated, who are in disbelief about the fact that they have COVID, it's the nurses that take the brunt of that, the verbal and, and sometimes physical abuse that comes from that frustration from the patient. Some continue to face those conditions. I usually tell myself one day at a time because that's all we can do at this point. But I mean, <laughs> I can't do it, you know, when it comes down to it. Even if she's replaced, it means less experience on the front lines when it matters most. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Now, BC is taking additional steps to curb the spread of COVID-19, announcing a vaccine mandate for all workers in healthcare facilities. This includes all people, all workers, students, physicians, residents, contractors and volunteers. The new order will come into effect on October 26th. Until now, only workers in long-term care facilities faced a vaccine mandate. The province also announced it will be providing a third shot to some of the 300,000 people who are immunocompromised. Well, the B.C. government says more than 2 million people have registered for a vaccine card system, which launched today. People 12 and up now have to show proof of immunization to enter most non-essential businesses. Brady Strachan looks at how today's rollout went. Hi there. Okay. At businesses across British Columbia, this is the new normal. Perfect. Do you have some idea with that? Proof of vaccination is now required for everything from restaurants and gyms to theaters and concerts. For many customers, it's as simple as showing their vaccine card saved to their smartphone. Yeah, we're two hours in, so it's uh, so far pretty good. We've had uh, only one upset person so far. This business owner says he's a bit nervous about policing it. And I've got, you know, some younger staff that we work in the door and we put protocols in place to protect them. Um, at the same time, it's about the aggressive nature that we hope we don't have to see. Not everybody is happy with the new measures. Protesters here in Kelowna have added the vaccine card to the list of health orders they are against. Several dozen people are rallying in front of the health authority. Researchers say protesters like these are in the minority. I expect that the VC vaccine card will be relatively well accepted. Um, this is because it is voluntary, privacy sensitive, uh, temporary, and this type of program is generally well accepted by the public. Some businesses have vowed not to enforce the vaccine card, something that could net them up to $10,000 in fines. The RCMP says officers will respond to any disturbance, including reports of people against the vaccine card planning to call in fake orders at restaurants. These are not tolerable. The public uh, test of tolerance for this at this point is very low. We need to get this pandemic behind us. That's something customers at this Kelowna restaurant are eager to do. You know, we have to do something and, you know, I, um, I don't know if this is the right thing to do or not for everybody, um, but yeah, I feel like we're moving in a positive direction, I guess. Yeah. They hope the vaccine card is one way to achieve that. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna, British Columbia. 
And let's look now at the COVID news in other parts of the country. We've never had a complete shutdown of services. This is the first time we've ever had a complete shutdown. This is the worst we've ever seen. Officials in Edmonton postponed all day surgeries in the city today. Intensive care units across Alberta have a record-breaking 198 COVID patients. The province confirmed 4,740 new COVID cases over the past three days. Saskatchewan reported 449 new cases today. That is a new daily record for COVID. The number of hospitalized COVID patients also rose, topping 200 for the first time. A new emergency order will redeploy staff for the surging hospital cases and new plans are also underway to increase Saskatchewan's ICU capacity. While we are able to address the current level of hospitalizations, we do not want to wait until we reach a critical state to introduce changes. And 122 new COVID cases of the weekend has New Brunswick's Premier considering reintroducing some pandemic measures. Blaine Higgs says Cabinet will meet tonight to discuss the possible changes, which could include a proof of vaccination program for the province. Well, it hasn't taken long for schools across the country to feel the fourth wave. Cases and exposures to the virus are on the rise, sending students home and in some cases shutting down schools. But as Kayla Hounsell explains, the responses to the outbreaks are different almost everywhere you go. Derek Power and his kids are trying to make the best of a bad situation. All schools in the Charlottetown area are closed due to an outbreak of COVID-19. I can't overthink it, it just gets too frustrating. There are only actually cases at two schools, but PEI is moving hard and fast. The province is also considering mandatory vaccination or routine testing for teachers who can't or won't get vaccinated. Although 90% of school staff on the island already are. However, it is not 100% and it is not high enough for me to be comfortable. New Brunswick has detected positive COVID cases in 11 schools across the province. Effective tomorrow, students of all ages in all schools across New Brunswick must wear a mask in school and while on school buses. But Nova Scotia is planning to take the masks off on Monday. The province's pediatric advisory group is advising otherwise. Keep them on for now. Let's be smart about it. It's up to you now as individuals. Protect yourself, your families, your learning. Yellowknife Public Health closed schools tonight because it is not able to keep up with testing and contact tracing. But in Windsor, Ontario, where hundreds of students have already been dismissed, the acting medical officer of health wants to keep schools open. Quebec is implementing rapid testing, which this expert calls a good first step. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a single step and it's a slow step. And this is a race. This is not a walk. So the, the fact that it's being implemented in some schools and the fact that there are very few details on how it's going to be implemented um, leaves us still with some question marks. Back on the island, this dad has had to take two days off work without pay because his kids are out of school. You have to rearrange your whole life to accommodate for children for sure and it just puts everybody in an unwanted situation I guess. An unwanted situation everyone hopes won't get worse. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well a new report from a major medical journal says for most of us booster shots are not necessary right now. Scientists writing in The Lancet concluded that vaccines remain highly effective against severe disease and hospitalization. And they say while protection against mild disease may go down over time, the shots will still prevent you from getting seriously ill. So far, health officials in Canada are only recommending third doses for certain immunocompromised people. Okay, here's some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. The community of Amherst, Nova Scotia, is mourning the tragic deaths of a family of six today. A fire tore through their travel trailer last night. The RCMP says it happened on a road in a nearby community. The cause of the fire under investigation, but officials say it does not appear to be suspicious. Apple has issued an urgent new security update after Toronto-based Citizen Lab found a vulnerability that could allow hackers to infect the company's devices without the user clicking on any links. Researchers say the flaw allowed the use of a so-called zero-click method to download spyware onto the phone of a Saudi activist. Okay, turning to the federal election campaign now. And as we said earlier, just a week to go in a tight race. Our latest poll tracker shows the Liberals leading the Conservatives by less than one percentage point. The NDP in third and the People's Party, the Bloc and the Greens all further back. 
voter participation, meanwhile, has been high so far. Elections Canada says 1.3 million Canadians voted on Friday, the first day of advanced polls, and Saturday's count surpassed the 970,000 early votes cast on day two of the 2019 election. Now, most voters will not be marking their ballots until next Monday, so the battle for hearts and minds very much continues. Our reporters are traveling with the leaders on the campaign, where today there was a shift in tone. We're going to start with Ashley Burke, who's with the Liberal Party leader. In the final days of a tight race, Justin Trudeau sharpening his attack against his main opponent, zeroing in on conservative Aaron O'Toole. He wants to see communities get assault weapons back amongst them, back across the country. That doesn't make sense, but it only makes sense because he's in the pocket of the gun lobby. He's giving in to his anti-vax fringe elements in his caucus. Trudeau said his attacks were just about policy because Canadians have a stark choice to make. But in an answer to my question today, he wouldn't speculate on election outcomes and if anything less than the majority would be a failure for him. I'm Hannah Thibodeau with Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole at his virtual studio in Ottawa. O'Toole came out swinging today with very pointed, direct, personal attacks against Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. When Mr. Trudeau was partying, and we've all seen the photos, I was doing search and rescue missions in the military. Every Canadian has met a Justin Trudeau in their lives. Privileged, entitled, and always looking out for number one. He was looking out for number one when he called this expensive and unnecessarily unnecessary election in the middle of a pandemic. Expect to hear a lot more negative campaigning this week. The Liberals got a slight bump up over the weekend, but the sharper tone is also an attempt to shore up a base that may be considering wandering to the People's Party of Canada. I'm David Thurton with the NDP in Nishkandiga, a small First Nations community in northern Ontario that has come to symbolize a promise unfulfilled, the Liberal government's failure to end all long-term boil water advisories in communities like this. This community has been under one since 1995. We are in the 21st century with incredible technology. What is it then? That has meant that Mr. Trudeau promised in 2015 to make sure every community had clean drinking water and that it hadn't happened. I don't buy for a second that is, that is anything other than the political will. Singh's platform promises nearly $3 billion to close the gap on First Nations communities like this. But beyond more money, Singh didn't really specify how we would solve things like the lack of training or equipment breakdowns, other issues preventing clean water from getting to communities. Now, today marks the 15th anniversary of the Dawson College shooting in Montreal. In 2006, a gunman killed an 18-year-old woman and injured 16 others using a weapon legally obtained at the time. In a question about Conservative Party gun policy on our face-to-face -face segment last night, Aaron O'Toole said the weapon had been obtained illegally. Today, he clarified, saying he meant it had been unlawfully transported and stored. Now, the Beretta CX-4 Storm has been prohibited since then, and today O'Toole was asked whether a Conservative government would keep that ban in place. Well, I've said we're going to keep the restrictions that are in place in place, uh, focus on public safety and security while we take the politics out of the classification discussion. The party has said there will be a public review of the firearms classification system. Okay, now we're going to hand things over to Rosie with tonight's installment of a special television event we are bringing you this week on The National. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau is going face-to-face -face with undecided voters. We're bringing them together virtually so they can put their questions directly to the Liberal leader. How am I going to be able to afford a home? What would you do to address the growing income inequity in this country? How can you make me and others like me feel safe? I asked you, do you understand that people may feel frustrated with the fact that we're in an election campaign? Face-to-face yes. -face with Justin Trudeau, that's next on The National.
Welcome to Face to Face with the Federal Leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton here in the National Studio in Toronto. Just one week left in the election campaign. So this week, we've got each of the leaders of the major national federal parties to sit down with us. And then, as we should, we're handing things over to you. We've invited four undecided voters to put their questions to one of the leaders. And after their questions, I might have a couple of my own. But really, this time belongs to them, to the voters. Last night, we heard from Aaron O'Toole. And tonight, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau joins us. Hello, good of you to make the time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, we asked each of our voters to send us a quick video to introduce themselves. So let's meet the first one. Hi, my name is Ahmed Hassan. I'm a renewable energy contractor and entrepreneur living in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a diehard Raptors fan and technology enthusiast. In my free time, I enjoy reading, watching documentaries, and spending time with my family. I am an undecided voter of this election because none of the party's platforms fully resonate with me. This election, the issues on my mind are the economy post-COVID-19, personal health freedoms, and the rising division within Canada. Okay, Ahmed, over to you. My question to you, Prime Minister, is the cost of goods and services has increased while our purchasing power has decreased. What are you going to do to get the economy back on track? First thing is getting done with COVID. We have to get through that. So first of all, uh, how we're going to get young people going again, uh, help for you to buy your first home uh, with money for, uh, for housing, uh, protection for your rights. We're going to move forward on uh, things like uh, post-secondary education supports. We also need to move forward on things like childcare. As you look towards having a, a family, childcare costs are way too, uh, too expensive across the country. We're going to get those down to $10 a day. All those things are not just good to support families for the right reasons. They're also how you make sure you're growing the economy in the right way. What we were able to do in the first years was reduce poverty uh, by a million people, uh, while at the same time as we created a million jobs. It's doing those two things together, of supporting people and creating growth opportunities. Uh, that is the way we're going to get through COVID and beyond. Ahmed, do you have anything else, or shall I give it a go? Uh, you can give it a go. <laughs> OK, we'll come back. Um, I'm going to start on, on the labor shortage, because there is a, a labor shortage in different sectors across the country. Um, the CRB that was put in place to support people through the pandemic, obviously, it won't stop until the end, close to the end of October. Does it make sense to use borrowed money both to pay people not to work and to compensate employers to get people to work? At what point do you say enough? We're already replacing the C, uh, CRB yeah. with a hiring benefit, uh, which actually is money for employers uh, to either top up the, the pay they're offering people or uh, hire on new people because we need to get that going. You mentioned the labor shortage. Yep. We had a labor shortage in many parts of the country going into the pandemic. That's making it, that, that's obviously the pandemic made it worse. Mm -hmm. um, but, but a lot of people also are, took, it, took time in the pandemic to rethink what it is they wanted to do. And the CERB has actually gone down to $300 yes. a yep. week from 500 so that's not even minimum wage at full time. Th we have to continue to support people who need it because, like I made a promise to everyone, uh, that we were going to have your backs as long as, uh, as, long as we needed to. Uh, on, on stimulus, you, you've now promised increased spending $78 billion over five years. What would you say to Canadians about why you still need to spend that kind of money? It's not about spending that amount of money. It's about what you invested in. Um, the $30 billion we're putting forward for $10 a day childcare will make a huge difference right across the country, not just to families, but to employers and businesses. And we decided we were going to help people as much as was necessary, generously, not because it was just a nice thing to do. It's because our economy bounces back faster when we do that. That's what the international organizations all said, and that's what we've shown. We're back to 95% of all the jobs lost during the pandemic, whereas the U.S. is only back at 76% of recovery of those jobs. Ahmed, do you have anything else there? Or uh, I'm just wondering about <laughs> what is your government going to exactly do to curb inflation? Uh, listen, we are very concerned about inflation, and that's why we're putting in uh, $4 billion into, uh, into uh, making sure we're building more homes uh, through working with municipalities. We're giving you extra supports, tens of thousands of dollars uh, that you can put towards a down payment on top of things that we've already done okay. over the past years. We're going to head to our next voter now. Take a look at this. Hi there, my name is Dodie Ferguson and I'm an undecided voter. I live here in Regina, Saskatchewan. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm an aunt, I'm a granddaughter, 
but more importantly, I am grandmother to two adorable grandchildren. I come from a farming and ranching family from the Cows' First Nation here in Treaty 4 territory. I feel very strongly about a strong, stable future for my children and my grandchildren. I am also very passionate about helping Canadians understand this concept of reconciliation to help them along in their journey and hopefully help them write relations with us as Indigenous people so we can have a mutually respectful and beneficial relationship together. I am undecided because I find that a lot of the party platforms in this election and the leaders are tending to miss the mark when it comes to concerns and issues that we as Indigenous people face in this country. Okay, Dodi. Hi there, uh, Mr. Trudeau. A lot of the young Indigenous workers have been encouraged to, and Indigenous families are employed in the oil, gas, and mining industries in this province. What can you tell me that would encourage me to vote Liberal this time around, taking into consideration the future for my children and my grandchildren as Indigenous workers in Canada? Oh, thank you, Dodi, for your question. And it's about partnerships. It's about understanding that Canada is a country of natural resources, and always, uh, al that'll always be a big part of our economy. But there's ways we can do it, things we can invest in, uh, partnerships we can build that are sort of longer in the stewardship. One of the things we're putting forward in this election is a $2 billion fund for communities in Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, and Newfoundland to help transform, to help look at what the next opportunities are beyond oil and gas, because even the big oil and gas companies have recognized they have to hit net zero by 2050 as well. We're going to help them by putting uh, a cap on the emissions uh, that that sector can put out and start to decrease it with them. Anything else, Dodi? I guess I'm still back to my question. How does this make this uh, an enticement for us to vote for you? Well, the work that we've done uh, with uh, Indigenous communities across the country on uh, economic reconciliation, on investing in entrepreneurship programs, uh, in training programs, working with unions to bring in and mandate bringing in uh, higher proportions of young Indigenous uh, kids into those programs so they can get the Red Seal certifications, uh, working in communities to uh, have tens of thousands of kids across the country in Indigenous communities start in new schools. So those are concrete things we've done together. Okay, Dodi, I have a couple questions on, on reconciliation, mm -hmm. uh, if that's okay. In 2015, you promised to eliminate all boil water advisories um, uh, in Indigenous communities. I wonder, and then just recently, of course, you said we're not going to meet that deadline. I wonder if it was a mistake to make, create that expectation, to suggest that it could take that amount of time. This is an issue that has been the reality for far too many Indigenous communities for decades in this country. So I said, you know what? We're going to make a big, big bold moonshot, and we're going to do it. And when Except we you didn't do it. Well, we, we lifted 109 of the 105 that were originally in yep. place, and we now have a plan and projects and money for all of them. On unmarked graves, um, y you talked really tough to the Catholic Church uh, over the course of the summer. After you have yet, though, or, or any government, has yet to get them to pony up the money for the settlement, $25 million that was supposed to be part of the Indian Residential School settlement. So why should um, Canadians, Indigenous people, believe that you're going to get the church to act differently? I went to see the Pope and asked him personally and directly to please step up on this and come and make the apology in person. Um, and as a Catholic, I'm kind of embarrassed that my church has continued to not do what I think is part of the core of the faith, which is uh, reconciliation, forgiveness, atonement, those sorts of things. Um, so I'm going to keep pushing. And but the, the, the decision that you made uh, to appoint a special interlocutor to be sort of the person that goes between communities and the government and supposedly the church, will that person, could that person also have the ability to find and, find and seek justice for some of these acts that are yes. criminal acts? Is that part of the mandate? Yes, that is part of the mandate to look at the legal framework, look at the legal tools that we have. Okay. Thank you, Dodie. Appreciate your questions. When we come back, more face-to-face -face with Justin Trudeau. Stay with us. What would you do to address the growing income inequity in this country? What do you, as a leader, plan to do to ensure that Canadians from all walks of life feel safe and protected? Welcome back to Face to Face. We're going to head to our next voter now. 
My name is Ty Simpson. I am 29 years old and I live just north of Bowmanville, Ontario with my parents Neil and Suzanne and my Fox Red Labrador Retriever, Finn. Uh, for the past two and a half years, I have been working at a big box retail operation uh, near my parents' home, a job that pays little and has not much in the way of prestige but allows me to explore my artistic interests, uh, namely writing and releasing original music. I am an undecided voter because I do not subscribe to any particular political orientation, nor do I have any alliance to any political party. I will soon be moving out with my partner Nicole and would vote for any party which I felt would give us the best chance at success in the future. Okay, Ty, your time with Mr. Trudeau starts now. Over to you. Hello, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, should you be re-elected, what would you do to address the growing income inequity in this country and improve the lives of low-income workers, uh, many of which, such as myself, were asked to continue working through the pandemic despite an increased risk to their safety? Now, first of all, Ty, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, continuing to do the things that society needed, that we all needed to stay safe and get through it. Uh, so whether it's better access to education if you want to go back to school, better supports for artists, or better support for you and your partner to be able to buy their home with a, a real uh, housing strategy that's going to put more money into your pocket and support in the creation of supply, there's lots of things that we need to do and we want to be there to support you on it. Anything else, Ty? No, that's all. Really? Okay, let me ask about sick days. I'm sure that's something that, that has occurred to, to Ty. And I should point out, we've got a lot of people on a Zoom call here too, and maybe it's something that they've thought about. Um, you promised to boost sick days during this campaign for federal workers up to 10 years, 10 days a year rather. The NDP had been pushing for you to do that throughout the pandemic. Why did it take an election for you to get there? Except the federal government doesn't get to no, regulate the that, sick yeah. days that yeah. Ty gets. Yeah. Uh, federally regulated sectors already had five days sick leave. Um, we're boosting that up to 10, and we're committing to work with the provinces to be able to bring in more. What we did bring in during the yeah. pandemic was that two weeks of boost uh, that wasn't perfect because it was a workaround on provinces that didn't have that yet. You know very well that there were some provinces that were very reluctant to introduce that at all, that you really had to do it kicking and screaming. Yes. How do you plan to force provinces to take, to do something that's within their jurisdiction? What we're going to keep doing is put the pressure on the provinces to do the right thing. And on childcare, for example, a number of them stepped up. Some are, are you know, really resistant, but I know the pressure from uh, voters like Ty uh, on the provincial levels, uh, pressure from families, pressure from people who actually know, yeah, paid sick leave is a really good idea. Yeah. We've demonstrated an ability to push the provinces to do things. It, 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 let's talk about inequalities and, and vulnerable people. So you, you frequently say we were all in this pandemic together, but really we were not. We were all affected in different ways. Mm -hmm. How do you address this very thing that Ty is talking about, that there are some people that made money off the pandemic and some people who are struggling to get out of it? What do you well, do? Obviously, my decision, our decision, was to help people more. And yes, the people who were able to save during the pandemic uh, are uh, now able to respend in the economy, and it's not money that is lost. The other thing we're doing is we're actually asking the biggest, most profitable banks and insurance companies uh, to pay significantly more so that we can help people like Ty uh, get, uh, buy a new home, so we can move forward on recognizing the sacrifices that small businesses and others made. Okay, because one of the things you are promising is childcare. The Conservatives are obviously taking a different approach. They're saying we're going to give a tax credit. It's going to affect mostly, help mostly lower income Canadians, is their claim. And people can make choices based on the money that they have and how they want to use it for their children. You obviously want to uh, lower fees in a broad way across the board and create some spaces. Why not do more to help the families with the cost? Because that is going to take a bit of time to get to your $10 a day. Uh, actually, the, health, uh, the uh, child care costs will be cut in half. Uh, over the next year. Yes. So it'll make an immediate difference worth thousands of dollars for families. We need to build 250,000 new spaces across the country. Uh, a tax break won't do that, won't create a single space. But why can't provinces do that? Why do you have to get involved well, in that plan? That's a really good question because 25 years ago, Quebec did that. Mm -hmm. They created 
uh, $10 a day childcare down to $8.50 now. And we saw participation in the workforce by women uh, and growth rates uh, skyrocket because of it. But even with that, none of the other provinces wanted to do it. BC started making promises around it and we said, you know what? This matters so much to Canadian families, it matters so much to our economy that we're going to foot the bill for it. So that $30 billion we're putting forward that Mr. O'Toole is cutting to use somewhere else, that's actually going to create spaces, going to save families $10,000 in some places a year uh, and uh, make sure that we have quality spaces uh, that are available. Okay, stay with us. We'll have more questions for Liberal leader Justin Trudeau right after this break. I want to hear more about what policies I can expect from your government to really, you know, counter what I see as growing hate crimes and incidents in Canada. <laughs> Welcome back to Face to Face. Let's get to our next questioner now. Hi everyone, my name is Pooja Bagri and I'm from Toronto, Ontario. I recently just completed my PhD from McMaster University specializing in immunology and I currently work in the health research sector. Born and raised in the east end of the city, I was really fortunate to grow up in a very diverse neighborhood. And I think that really fueled my passion for traveling and learning about new cultures. As a first generation Canadian, I feel really lucky that my parents decided to settle down in such a multicultural city such as Toronto when they immigrated from India in the 1980s. I've always been proud to be Canadian and I've never taken for granted the freedoms and privileges that come with living in such a great country. However, a recent incident I faced at the local grocery store, along with the rise of hate crime that we hear in the news almost every day, has really made me question how inclusive we truly are as a society. Okay, Pooja, over to you. Hi, thank you. And Mr. Trudeau, thank you for speaking with us. So what I want to know is, what do you, as a leader, plan to do to ensure that Canadians from all walks of life feel safe and protected? Thank you, Pooja. We need to stand even stronger against intolerance and hate. Part of that is making sure that weapons designed to kill the largest number of people as possible as quickly as possible remain banned, which is something that inexplicably the Conservatives want to go back on. But the other piece of it is uh, online hate, uh, where, yes, freedom of speech is going to be really important to continue to protect always, but not freedom to hate. Uh, and freedom to incite to violence. And a lot of it is partnership with grassroots community organizations in, uh, in various communities to be able to actually uh, keep themselves safe, but also uh, reach out to their neighbors. But I wanna hear more about what policies I can expect from your government to really you know, counter what I see as growing hate crimes and incidents in Canada. We have put far-right uh, terrorist organizations on Canada's terrorist list, white supremacy organizations. We are uh, taking significant steps to counter the rise of white supremacy and extremism. Uh, within 100 days, uh, we will be moving forward with putting forward legislation on uh, online harms uh, and uh, cracking down on hate speech. We're continuing to invest in community safety programs, which you know, breaks my heart to do, but uh, to protect mosques and synagogues and community centers, we continue to invest in uh, more education, more uh, community programs uh, to, to bring people together rather than d drive them apart. And we will always, and I will always, stand against intolerance and hatred uh, wherever it is. It shouldn't be in Canada, and it is, and that's why we need to keep working on that. Last word to you there, Pooja. Yeah, and you know, this this goes into sort of the last question I really had for you based on what you've been saying and just seeing some of the things that have been happening during your campaign stops. If someone like you could face such a barrage of anger, then what about regular folks like me? How vulnerable am I? So how can you make me and others like me feel safe? We need to make sure that we are unequivocal in standing up for the open, generous, free society that we are. And it's not a small, angry uh, minority that is very loud and quite scary uh, to a lot of people that is going to start to define the country we are. Okay, Pooja, I'm going to follow up. You did on that first uh, day that you encountered, you know, a, a sort of threatening group of people. You weren't so compassionate in the days following. Does that not fuel what those people are doing? 
and, and are you not worried that you are missing an opportunity to educate them? Um, first of all, I, I will not meet anger with anger. I will try to be compassionate. But I am going to stand continually strong for the almost 80% of Canadians who did the right thing, who were able to get themselves vaccinated, and those others who are putting them at risk, I have less and less patience for. I get that, but I wonder if your uh, decreasing patience with them yeah. is not pushing them further away from where you want to get them. You, you want these people to get vaccinated. There right? are folks who are coming out to scream profanities at healthcare workers are not going to be convinced by a well-meaning uh, advertising campaign. But a lot of people who still haven't gotten vaccinated are hesitant for personal reasons, for uh, language reasons, for cultural yeah, that's a reasons. Different, that's a different thing. And yep. we are yep. reaching out to them and we are encouraging them to say, well, look, if you want to go on vacation, even if you're not sure about it, even you're scared of it, uh, you're going to need to get a shot, so please get a shot. But are there some people you have to give up on? Some people it's just not going to happen. There's no convincing them. Some people you need to protect other Canadians from. And that's what I am unequivocal about doing. And quite frankly, what any leader who can't even get his candidates vaccinated is not doing. Time for a quick break, but up next. We're a week away from voting day uh, when, when this airs. A lot of people are still very confused about what the heck is happening. Why the heck you did this in the first place? Do you understand why they might feel that way? That they thought the country was just plugging along and they didn't really want to have an election. <laughs> I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're a week away from voting day uh, when, when this airs. A lot of people are still very confused about what the heck is happening. They didn't really want to have an election. Yes, but people also know that getting back to normal depends on the decisions that governments take. And those decisions don't get taken two years from now. You could have done it in six months. There was yeah, nothing yeah. pressing, was there? there uh, climate change is pressing. Ending, ending, ending this pandemic is pressing. And that means vaccine mandates now, not six months from now. Okay. People, uh, people deserve to be able to choose. So if you were going to, if, if we come back, that's a minority liberal government, you're going to be okay with that? Canadians deserve to have their okay. say. Two more questions. One of them is about climate change. Our emissions aren't dropping yet. Why are you so confident, though, that you can raise the targets again, given that it did take probably too long to get to where we're going to be? Our plan we announced last December yep. gets us to 36%. We need to get to 40, 45 and beyond. We need to get to net zero. What we're proposing in this election, a cap on oil and gas sector emissions that will start decreasing, uh, moving aggressively on zero emission vehicles, moving aggressively on getting a, a net zero electricity grid, moving aggressively on protecting more of our land and oceans than we ever have before. We are able to do it. Why not just try to govern for two more years? Because you know that you have a plan. Well, everything we are doing uh, in a minority government goes slower. Uh, your and budget more was passed, challenged. your throne speech went ahead. Yeah, but the conversion therapy wasn't banned. You put we that on the table at the last minute. Yeah, we did not. We've been working on it for many, many months. Took a you while. know that. Took a while. Yes. You said that over the years you end up carrying a number of things. You've had three ethics investigations. One of them concluded that there was a breach. Two others did not. Is the baggage from being around for a while, being the Prime Minister, starting to get in the way of Canadians trusting you and wanting to give you another chance? Because you know you've got the baggage, you've admitted it. Of course, it. of course. I have, I have you know, the, the, the scars to prove it on the big things that we've fought for, on the well, things that we've done. Well, some of the mistakes that you've made, too. the things that we haven't done. Yes, Absolutely. but the things that you have made mistakes on. For sure. Yeah. For sure. You can't govern uh, in a way that you're not going to, you know, wish that you could have done things differently or things could have ha gone differently. It should always be hard to convince Canadians that you're the right person to lead them because this is a really important job in an amazing country with huge challenges. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all, the voters, super great undecided voters with fantastic questions. Thank you for those. Thank you to our Zoom audience for uh, dialing in and listening along. That's this special edition of The National. You can see the full conversation on CBC Gems, cbcnews.ca, and again, after your late local news on CBC television tomorrow night. It's face-to-face -face with the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh. I'll see you then. Good night.